Hello class, welcome to chapter six. Chapter six will be covering Northern and Southern Europeans. This is a map of the territory we're gonna be talking about. Um, Northern Europe is primarily up here and includes the countries Great Britain, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and some of the northern parts of France. Southern Europe lies along the Mediterranean Sea and includes Italy, southern France, Spain, and Portugal. So southern Europe is going to be this region right here. History. We have had most of our influence from European immigrants. As you know, they were the first settlers to what is now known as the United States, and many of their cultures, religions, and foods have influenced us for our lifetimes. Um, European idea of a meal is actually quite simple. I have an interesting background. I told you during the last lecture, Food and Religion, that I grew up with a father who was Jewish. That's true. Um, my mother is not religious at all, and she is uh, from Europe. She was actually born in Africa, but she's of European descent. She's British. And so um, I was actually born in England, and so I am European. And so as a child, I spent time visiting my grandma and my uncle who live in England, and I enjoyed many European type meals. What they are, a large serving of meat, a small serving of starch, and a small serving of a veggie. They're very kind of plain, they don't believe in a lot of seasonings, and this is particularly true for uh, Northern European meals, slightly different in the South. Um, but we would have, you know, maybe a piece of a roast with some carrots and some mashed potatoes or a piece of ham with some broccoli and a roll, something like that. Very, very simple. What was a European idea of a meal is now what we consider a lot of American ideas of a meal. So meat, starch, and vegetable, something along those lines. Focusing in on Northern Europeans, I mentioned the countries that are represented by Northern Europe already, and this includes some of Northern France. France has some of the best farmland in all of Europe, and it's of course known for its wine production. They're also well known for tomatoes, grapes, olives, um, as well as animal husbandry. This is a picture of the United States. You can notice that it's the northeast side of the United States and percent of the population claiming English ancestry by country. So the farther that you go towards the northeast, there's a higher percent of people who say that they are English um, by ancestry, meaning they have immigrated from Great Britain and come to the United States. Immigration patterns. So immigrants from Great Britain settled in New England, Virginia, Maryland, as you could see from that last map. This was the first group of immigrants and they immigrated to avoid religious persecution. Then immigration slowed down quite a bit. Immigrants from Ireland. So there were quite a few immigrants from Ireland, and they came due to hardship, famine, and religious persecution in Ireland. There was a big slump in the textile industry in Ireland. There was the Irish potato famine, which you may have heard about. Um, it wiped out the majority of the potato crops and actually caused the death of a million people. And there were religious persecutions that were going on in Ireland, and so people fled for those reasons. When Irish initially immigrated, they were given kind of poor stereotypes, often stereotyped as drunk, um, kind of outrageous, uh, misbehaving. However, they quickly rose um, as far as economic status goes, as well as prestige, and many Irish now have very professional careers and jobs. France. France has had the smallest yet consistent immigration, and currently we can find some remnants of French immigration in Louisiana and New England. British and Irish socioeconomic status. 
So there are quite a few uh, British and Irish in American. So 25.3 million Americans of British descent. That is a lot. Um, that actually went down from the previous census. It used to be 29 million. So we're actually potentially having less immigration from these countries. 34.7 million from Irish descent. And like I mentioned before, Irish have done really well professionally. Many of them hold advanced graduate degrees um, and they're more likely to attend college than any other immigrant group. French. There are 8 million Americans with French and ancestry. This again has gone down since the previous census. And there are also population of French Canadians. So French from Canada um, who speak French, but they originated in Canada and they live in the US. The French Canadians tend to hang on more to their French culture than the, Fra the French who have immigrated from France. Northern Europe worldview. So there was a lot of religion from each of these places uh, of origin as well as from places where people immigrated from. I already mentioned many immigrated due to religious persecution and that is absolutely true. British came to escape the persecution from the Church of England. Um, Irish came to escape religious persecution, but when they got here, the church actually played a really big role and helped them rise to some of those prestigious jobs as well as expand their education. This pictured on the top right is the Irish church. Um, it's very, very nice, very fancy, kind of an old historical style. And then French also believed in the church and Catholicism was crucial to their daily life. Family. Family in Britain was the typical nuclear family, and my family is an example of this. Mom, dad, father, uh, father, mother, and two children, you know, or maybe it would be one child with a father and a mother. You didn't have a lot of extended family members living together. They perhaps lived in the same country, but not necessarily the same house or even the same city. Children are generally spent, sent to private schools and or boarding schools, and these schools cost money. In my mother's family, her brother was the favorite of the family, and so he was sent to an expensive school. She was sent to a less expensive school because they couldn't afford to send them both to the same school. Irish tend to marry at a late age, have large families, and were very well educated. French. The French Canadians are called Franco-Americans, and many enjoyed acculturating, mixing in with the American culture. Family size was large, but decreased somewhat, and it was common for France, unlike in Italy, or sorry, unlike in Ireland and Great Britain, to have many family members living under the same roof. Traditional health beliefs and practices. So they believed that good diet, plentiful sleep, daily exercise, fresh air, cleanliness, and keeping warm were valued. British and Irish believes that health depends on proper attitude, and attitude was inclusive of religious attitude and a rigorous lifestyle. Moderation in diet was encouraged and associated with good GI health. GI means gastrointestinal, so this is like your stomach and intestines. And because they put such a focus on GI health, they commonly took laxatives. They also believed that spicy foods could cause GI upset. Spoiled foods or incompatible foods could cause GI upset. So they had a lot of kind of food preferences based on this health belief. What kinds of foods did they enjoy and were common? So in Great Britain and Ireland, animal products were very important. Like I said, you defined a meal by it having meat as the centerpiece, and they would eat chicken, fish, eggs, pork, beef, veal, um, and all sorts of game animals as well. They liked sausages, they liked bacon, um, eggs are commonly served at breakfast. They also enjoy fish and chips. When they say chips, what they actually mean is French fries. So this is a different kind of variation of the chips. Um, we think of chips as like fried potato chips that are thin, but in England, chips are actually French fries. Fish and chips are usually fried. It's fried fish, typically cod, and it's often served with vinegar and then preserved smoked fishes were common as well. 
Dairy products were important, although there was some uh, lactose intolerance. And something called a plowman's lunch was common. A plowman's lunch could be served uh, in a bar, and it included a piece of cheddar cheese, bread, a pickled onion, and a pint of beer. So it was eaten by people of Great Britain and Ireland and could be served in a bar. Ireland is really well known for its dairying and cheese making, and they make some very delicious cheeses, um, such as double cream cheeses. And this isn't like cream cheeses that you put on a bagel, but this would be something like a brie cheese that has double cream. And pretty much what that means is it's very fatty. It's also very tasty. They're also known for Irish soda bread, and Irish soda bread is made with baking soda instead of yeast. Fruits and veggies are limited because it's a relatively cold climate given the northern, um, the northern latitudes. And then beverages include tea, beer, and whiskey. And the Irish are credited with the invention of whiskey. So if you do visit Ireland, which is on my to-do list, you can visit many different whiskey distilleries. France, common food. So cooking of France is divided into French cuisine and provincial or regional cooking. And French cuisine or classic French cuisine is also known as haute or haute or grand cuisine. So it's otherwise known as H-A-U-T-E or grand, G-R-A-N-D cuisine. Um, so these are other names for French cuisine. Classic French cooking is very formal. It's prepared in restaurants with ingredients from around the country. It usually involves butter and cream dishes, potentially using lard or duck or goose fat. It may involve more seasonings. Um, this is a picture of a rack of lamb that would be a typical restaurant entree. And then Provencal cooking would be simple cooking that's made at home, potentially using uh, local ingredients from the local bakery or the local farmer's market. As far as immigrants go, most of them came from the Brittany and Normandy region of France, and these regions are known for their dairy and their crepes. Crepes are very thin pancakes that can be filled with savory things or sweet things, such as whipped cream and fruit, Nutella, bananas, um, and or savory meats like ham or smoked salmon, and sometimes grilled vegetables. So you can use crepes for many different things. France and the food of France is broken up into different regions of France. So these are geographic regions of France and what they're known for. You have probably heard of Champagne and Champagne is named after a re region in France called Champagne, France. They also produce andoli, which is a type of sausage, pate, um, which is generally a liver, beer and other sausages. There is a region in France called Alsace-Lorraine and it borders Germany. Because of this, it has more German influence. You see the sausages, the pate, the quiche, and something called foie gras. And this spelling of foie gras um, is one spelling. I have also seen it spelled F-O-I-E, but this is going to be the topic of your discussion board for the week, for this chapter. And foie gras is duck liver that is produced generally by overfeeding the ducks, whether this is force feeding is gonna be up to you to decide. Other regions of France, so the terrain region of France. This, this region was otherwise known as the Garden of France. It's a very fertile region of France, meaning very many things grow there. That's why it's called the garden. And it's one of the highest producers of tomatoes. Tomatoes are key to French cooking. And um, when I visited France, there's actually been entire aisles in grocery stores just for tomatoes, all different types of tomatoes. Originally, when tomatoes were in Imported to France. They came from South America. Tomatoes were rejected because they looked a lot like a poisonous plant. And so originally tomatoes were eaten by poor people, but now they're eaten and enjoyed by everybody. The Burgundy region of France is near the south of France, and so it's a little bit warmer, and they enjoy Burgundy wines and cassis liquor, which is a black currant liquor.
The Bordeaux region of France is famous for the term a la Bordelais, and this has many possible meanings. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> a la Bordelais could mean one of four things. So prepared in a seasoned sauce containing red or white wine, marrow, tomatoes, butter, and shallots. That's the first meaning. The second one, use of a mirepoix, which is a fine mixture of carrots, onions, and celery with bay leaves and thyme. Third definition, accompanied by seeps, which happen to be large fleshy mushrooms. Fourth definition, accompanied by an artichoke and potato garnish. So it can mean quite a variety of things. The province region of France is near the Mediterranean Sea, and they are known for tomatoes, garlic, and olive oil, and the term a la Provencale, and this means a dish that contains those ingredients, so olives, um, olive oil, garlic, and tomatoes. So a dish with the name a la Provencale means it has these ingredients in it. Common dishes, a bouillabaisse, this is a fish stew with garlic, onion, and tomato, a ratatouille, tomatoes, eggplant, zucchini, and olive oil. The salad niqua is pictured there, and you can see it's a salad with just about everything on it. It's got tuna, tomatoes, olives, lettuce, and sometimes eggs. Pan bagna is a French bread sandwich that comes from the region and black truffles come from this region. And when I talk about truffles, I don't mean chocolate truffles. I'm actually referring to an underground fungus that grows deep in the dirt and soils underground and that's used as a seasoning in foods. Cooking styles, Great Britain and Ireland. So meat's generally roasted or broiled. That's a very simple way of cooking meat. Worcester sauce is used a lot. Mint jellies and chutneys are used. Chutneys are fruits and vegetable spreads that are kind of pickled and used as jellies. Nothing is wasted in Great Britain and they even eat something that's considered offal. It kind of is what it sounds like, but the offal is the parts of the animal that would usually be thrown away, um, such as the intestines, the brain, the tail, the heart, but all of these parts are used in England. Pies, they have pies, and the pies don't necessarily have to be sweet. They can be savory pies. They have something called pasties, and this is not a misspelling. It's not supposed to be pastry, it's a pasty. And this, to me, is a British version of an empanada, um, but it's like a pie crust that's been folded in half, kind of like a, um, a, kind of like a calzone, and it's stuffed with different things. They generally tend to be kind of bland, um, but they are tasty. There used to be a pasty store downtown San Luis Obispo, but it went out of business. They are well known for their desserts, and dessert is an important part of every meal. Um, this happens to be a picture of a trifle. So an English trifle is a very common dessert, and it has different layers of custard, pound cake, raspberries, and almonds. Cooking style. So classic French cooking style, we talked about a little bit, but this would be very carefully planned meal, likely served in a restaurant, and the dish would resemble harmony. Sauces and stocks are very important to French cooking. An Espanoli sauce would have, would be a brown sauce with a brown stock and a mirepoix and roux. A velote sauce would be a wine stock with a roux, onions, and spices. A bechamel sauce would be a cream sauce with milk and roux. Tomato sauce is what it sounds like. And a hollandaise sauce is egg yolks and drawn butter. French breads and pastries are very common and served at most meals, and they're generally made with white flour. And then something called Nouvelle Cuisine is classic French food that's merged with regional French food. So it has some influence from local French food availability. Cooking styles of France. I do want you to be familiar with rules of French cooking, and so they are listed here for your review, but you definitely should know these. Meal composition and cycle in Northern Europe. So in Great Britain and Ireland, they like to eat four meals per day. Lunch is generally big, but now it's enjoyed more on Sundays because more and more people are working. And then tea is very, very common. Sometimes it's called 
just tea. Sometimes it's called high tea. If it's called high tea, it will include more substantial foods such as sandwiches, fish, pastries, shrimp, and even something called potted meats. Potted meats are literally what they sound like, but they're meats that are in a tiny glass pot and they can be eaten with a spoon or a fork, sometimes with some added seasoning to them. In France, three meals a day are common. Snacking in seconds are uncommon. Um, my mom lived in France for quite a while and I went to visit her and this is something she had to warn me about because I love snacking and I love seconds. Um, but she kind of had to warn me, you know, make sure to eat a good meal because there's not going to be a time where we're having a snack in between the meal. French breakfast is very typical continental breakfast, so maybe a pastry with some jam, some coffee or tea, perhaps a fresh piece of fruit, perhaps not. Lunch is a very leisurely um, and formal meal at times. Some stores close during the lunch hour so that you can traditionally enjoy lunch. Schools, some French schools have 90 minutes for lunch so that the students can enjoy their lunch. Um, and some of the schools start their lunch with an appetizer and end with a salad. That sounds odd, but actually in French cooking, it's customary to end with a salad versus start with the salad. There is etiquette that is similar for Great Britain and France. Some of it includes um, not putting bread on a plate, but instead putting the bread on the table, folding the salad using your fork and knife versus cutting the salad, um, passing the food to the left, putting your hands in your lap when not eating, etc. Special occasions and holidays. So Great Britain and Ireland uh, celebrate Christmas for the most part. They also celebrate Easter. And this is a picture of hot cross buns. Hot cross buns are meant to represent the sun, the fire, and the church. They also enjoy something called Shrewsbury Simmel. And this is a spice cake made with marzipan. Scottish eat something called haggis on New Year's Eve. Excuse me. Haggis is something that might not be common in the United States. Um, my stepson actually went to Scotland for the summer, for summer school, and he was offered haggis. And it's a sheep stomach stuffed with pudding made of sheep innards and oatmeal. And if it's served to adults, they drench it with whiskey. So to me, I'm not sure how fond of it I'd be, but it's actually considered a delicacy and eaten on special occasions. So to each his own. France celebrates Christmas. They celebrate this with different puddings. Boudin is the word for pudding. And so they have boudin noir and boudin blanc. Noir is a black pudding, and it could actually be a blood sausage pudding or a meat pudding. And then the white pudding um, might be made with milk. Therapeutic uses of food. They do believe that food plays a big role in health and have some typical therapeutic foods. Adaptations of food habits. So like I said in the very beginning, these typical European dishes are now considered American food. French cooking has less of an influence, but many cities have French restaurants and French restaurants are often kind of highly regarded as being delicious, fancy, um, gourmet, etc. Some of the great, the, some of the dishes of Britain that are now considered American are apple pie, pumpkin pie, and pudding, for example. Louisiana. So Louisiana is an area where there is a lot of French influence as well as French Canadian influence and they have similar recipes to in France. However, they're using more local ingredients to Louisiana. So for example, seafood that's caught in the bay um, or the swamps. They do have beignets, which Louisiana is famous for, and these are round puff pastries fried like donuts. They usually brush some uh, white powdered sugar on top of them and they're supposed to be delicious. I've had beignets before but I've never been to New Orleans so I've never had New Orleans beignets but they're very good. Northern Europe, health status. So we do actually blame the Europeans for our high fat diet, our high cholesterol diet, low in fiber and low in complex carbs because those starches that are on the plates are usually white starches. I mentioned mashed potatoes, I mentioned a bread roll, and that's very traditional. 
Overweight and obesity is a problem. In France, you have about 40% overweight, 10% obese. In the UK, you have about 66% overweight, 25% obese. So some of those numbers mimic the United States. In France, they do practice kind of more portion control as well as walking from place to place. And so that's why I believe some of their BMIs are lower than in the United States. Southern Europeans. So we're done talking about Northern Europe. Now we're talking about Southern Europe. So Southern Europe includes Italy, Southern France, Spain, and Portugal. And this is actually a picture of my mother in Spain. I was with her taking this picture, so I sat across the table from her. Um, we were in Barcelona, Spain, which borders the sea, and so you can see there's a giant plate of seafood in front of us. And this was a very typical dish. <clears throat> Italians. So the, the majority of immigrants came from Italy um, and they faced discrimination and hostility, so they formed tight knit communities once they immigrated to the United States. Um, when I say the majority of the immigrants came from Italy, I mean the majority of the immigrants from Southern Europe, when you're looking at all the countries, most immigrants came from the country of Italy. They do form little Italy's, like I just mentioned. San Francisco, the Bay Area, has a little Italy that's full of Italian restaurants and Italian stores, and Italian delis, etc. cetera. They're very, very delicious, fun place to go. And most came for economic reasons and opportunity to make money. Spaniards. So a smaller amount of immigrants came. They settled kind of all over. Most of the Spaniards do speak Spanish. Some of them learned English when they came. And there's a very historical population from Spain that came. And these are the Basque people. They're from the Basque region of Spain, which is a very mountainous region of Spain. And they actually have their own language. It's called Euskera. And they're known for their own types of foods. Portuguese. Um, we don't have a lot of numbers on the Portuguese. It's about 1.4 million, um, but there are, have been more and more Portuguese immigrating to the United States in recent history. Italian. So who is living here and where? Um, you can read this kind of on your own. An interesting thing I'll add about the Spanish is they are now grouped in the same census category as Hispanics. So Spanish from Spain and Hispanic people from Mexico are considered the same according to our census. I think that that's slightly misleading. Um, I'm not totally sure the motivation for doing that, but prior to 2006, they actually had their own category. Now there's no way to differentiate when looking at the census data um, between somebody who is Spanish from Spain and Spanish speaking from Mexico. Worldview. Italians believe in the church. They're very, very strict Roman Catholics. In fact, the Spaniards and Portuguese are also strict Roman Catholics. You do have a little bit more variety within the Spaniards and some are Jesuits. Each member of an Italian family has responsibility in a Spanish family. It's a very masculine family. Generally, the father worked, the mom stayed home, took care of the children. Health beliefs. So some similar health beliefs to um, Northern Europeans. They did believe in fresh air. That was a similarity. They expect that health declines with age. They believe that illness may be due to genetics, which is heredity or contamination, potentially of food or liquids, beverages. They might believe in the evil eye, which we've talked about, and they might believe in supernatural causes, especially some of the French and French Canadians who are living potentially in the New Orleans area. Spanish and Portuguese, we do not have much information on their traditional health beliefs and practices. Foreign influence. So there was a lot of foreign influence to this region. Um, we had influence from the Phoenicians and Greeks, as well as the Muslims. Some of the foods that were brought were eggplants, lemons, origin, oranges, sugar, rice, spices. Marzipan was brought, um, and saffron. Saffron and marzipan, it's a sweetened almond paste that's used extensively in Italian desserts, and it came from the Mus the Muslims, that's marzipan, and then saffron is a seasoning that's commonly used in rice dishes. 
From India came bananas, mangoes, coconuts, all sorts of tropical fruits, as well as spices, a lot of Indian seasonings, and then foods that the Americans influenced as well. Chocolate, vanilla, tomatoes, all came from South America. Sweet potatoes, corn, squash, and turkey became staples of diet in Southern Europe, but did not originate there. Staple foods of Italy. I think when people think Italian food, for the most part, people like the way they think of Italian food. Italian food is pizza, it's pasta, it's raviolis, um, it might be meat, uh, veal, it might be garlic, olive oil, breads, parsley, etc. And so pasta is a main staple of Italy. Pasta can be made or served three different ways. These are the three ways here, asciutta and brodo or al forno. And you may see this if you're at an authentic Italian restaurant. Asciutta means with sauce and brodo means with soup and al forno means baked. In the north, they use more butter, dairy, and rice. Um, and in the south, they use more olive oil, fish, beans, and vegetables. So these are some differences between the north and the south. Staple foods of Spain. So these are pictures that I took. These are both in butcher shops in Spain. This was in Barcelona. You can see the top picture is uh, actually prosciutto ham. So this is a dried, salted, not cooked, but raw pork leg. And the drying and salting process itself cures the meat so that it's safe to eat. It's very kind of salty and savory tasting. And then the bottom is a simple um, butcher shop with sausages and different cuts of meats. Some of the things that are well known in Spain, tortilla española. This is not a traditional tortilla as we think of it, like a corn tortilla, um, but this is actually more like a pancake tortilla or an omelet tortilla. And it's made using potatoes and eggs and onions. And it actually ends up being about an inch thick. Um, and it's sliced kind of like a quiche, but potatoes are the main part of this tortilla española. Serrano ham is very common. It's sliced paper thin. Gazpacho is a cold vegetable soup. And then different desserts and wines are common as well. Portugal. So Portugal is surrounded on three sides by water and they do focus on seafood as kind of their main protein. They tend to use more spices than other areas and they like different things such as Cacolia, a stew made from pig's heart and liver, that's slightly alternative. Caldo verde, a soup with kale or cabbage and potatoes, and many different desserts. They also enjoy dried salted cod and sardines. Regional variations, Italy. So in the north of Italy, um, Milan area, they're well known for risotto, Parmesan cheese, polenta, which is a corn meal, um, base starch, veal, which is a young cow, uh, or cut from a young cow, oso buco, which is a veal stew, veal piccata, which is the veal from the young cow, then covered in capers, vermouth is a type of liquor. In Venice and the East Coast, they're centered on seafood because they're obviously have ocean very near, and so many seafood dishes. Burrita is a type of fish, and that is common in the Venice and East Coast area, so this is a type of fish. In the Bologna regions, they have rich gastronomy. So they make dishes with you know, very fancy presentations and the appearance of the dishes is very important. They have something called lasagna verde al forno, which is, is a spinach noodle pasta that's made into a lasagna and then baked in the oven. They have prosciutto ham. They have mortatella, which is a type of sausage. And then on this bottom right is a picture of prosciutto ham wrapped around cantaloupe. And this is a very popular appetizer because you get the cool, refreshing, slightly sweet cantaloupe along with the dry, salty prosciutto ham. Italy. So Florence, Tuscany regions of Italy are known for their fettuccine alfredo, which is a dish that is very popular in the US. The phrase alla fiorentina means to garnish a dish with spinach. So spinach is commonly used as a coloring, both on a dish and within a dish. They eat a lot of fish, game, rosemary, as a seasoning, Chianti wines, and chestnuts. 
Rome, also known for their fettuccine alfredo. They have something called gnocchi or G-N-O-C-C-I. This is a potato pasta. It's almost like a potato dumpling. And then the Campania or Naples region of Italy is the culinary capital of the South. This is where pizza um, may have started. Uh, the cheeses are very common and they're well known for desserts, such as this dessert pictured here, which is a cannoli. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. Origins of Pizza. This is a great video that you can watch if you're interested because who's not interested in pizza? And then regional variations of Spain. Cooking methods can be divided by preparation method. So in the north, stewing is common. In the central regions, roasting is favored. And in the south, frying is very common. Most Spaniard dishes prepared reflect the cooking of the southern region. They like fried fish, arroz negro. This is black rice that is colored with a squid ink. Salmorejo is very common. This is a tomato soup with ham and egg. In the Northwest, empanadas are common. Octopus is common. And then in the Basque region of Spain, lamb and dry salted cod is common. Portugal. So Portugal um, is surrounded mostly by sea. There's one part that's connected to the mainland. Um, but so they eat a lot of seafood and they have many foreign influences from Africa and America. They have a dish called Acordo de Acero. This is a mixture of cornbread, vinegar, onions, garlic, saffron, and lard. And it's boiled together and eaten for breakfast. Portugal is where port wines come from, which are very sweet and, in my opinion, delicious type of wine. Um, they cannot be called port wines if they don't actually come from Portugal. They can only be called port style wines. Meal composition. So similar to France, Italy and Italians enjoy a light breakfast with lunch as the main meal. Some of the things that they eat at lunch, um, a minestra is a wet course, it's usually soup. They have a dry course, which usually would be pasta, risotto, or gnocchi. And then the main course, they would have meat, vegetable, followed by a salad. Often their lunch in Italy is followed by a nap and they might have a light dinner or a late dinner. In Spain, they seem to be constantly eating, and by U.S. standards, they always are, so they'll have four meals plus snacks. It's very common to have a snack anytime you sit down at a restaurant, even if you're just getting a drink. Um, and the snacks there, or the appetizers per se, are called tapas. Perhaps you've had these at restaurants locally. Merienda is tea and a pastry snack, and then dinner is served very late. For me, this was very difficult because at home, I eat my dinner between five and seven o'clock. Many restaurants, the earliest some of the restaurants would open would be like nine o'clock, and I would be starving for dinner, um, not to mention tired. So that was hard for me to get used to. Portugal, similar patterns to Spain with lunch as the largest meal. However, dinner is eaten a little earlier. And etiquette, the etiquette between Italy, Spain, Portugal are very similar. Um, bread is to be eaten without butter. You are not supposed to use a spoon to help get the noodles or spaghetti onto your fork. You're supposed to say bon appetito or bon appetit or bon appetit. Uh, you do not give wine as a gift because there's a likelihood that the host has already picked out a nice wine to go with the meal. Italy. Italy celebrates few holidays. They mostly celebrate saints and they have festivals. Seafood is served on Christmas Eve. They have Jordan almonds, which are some of my favorite. Those are pictured there. In Spain, they celebrate a Holy Week. This is the week between Palm Sunday and Easter. And in Portugal, they celebrate the Holy Ghost Spirit Festival, which is an annual distribution of food to the poor. Therapeutic uses of foods. Some Italians categorize foods as heavy, light, wet, or dry. Heavy foods may include red meats or fried items. Light foods could include custards or soups, and light foods are appropriate for people who are sick. Wet foods have to do with how they're prepared and the inherent qualities. So for example, some foods such as leafy greens are wet. And some sicknesses are associated with people being too dry, so it's important to give them a wet food to help them get better. Garlic a day keeps the respiratory infections away, and then oil and vinegar are very health-promoting, which I would agree with all of the above. 
current adaptations of food habits. So milk and dairy, most adults don't drink milk, but cheese and dairy is very common. Meat, poultry, fish, um, some of the same meats are common in the US, uh, some that eat less fish. Fresh fruits are traditionally eaten as desserts, but as people acculturate, they eat less and less fresh fruits. Fats and oils, traditionally olive oil was one of the primary oils and used for everything. Immigrants to the United States tend to use less olive oil and merge towards the fat preferences of Northern Europeans, which would be maybe more butter, margarine, or lard. There's little research done on the nutritional status of Southern Europeans. In some immigrants, dairy intake is low, but they do eat sardines and small bones and fish. They also have mineral water, which can contribute significantly to their calcium intakes. Mediterranean diet is very healthy, and people who follow a Mediterranean type diet and lifestyle actually live longer than any other population in the world and have lower rates of heart disease. Obesity and overweight has increased significantly. You can see Spain very, very high, Portugal high, and Italy also high. So just like the United States, we're seeing increase in obesity, overweight, and the contributing chronic diseases that go with that. All right, so who did we talk about? Northern and Southern Europeans. What did they do? They ate delicious food in some areas, more bland food in others. When, now, and in the past, where? Italy, France, Great Britain, Ireland, um, Scotland, Portugal, places like that. Why? Because that's what grew there as well as that's what was brought in by other immigrants to the area. So they had a lot of foreign influence. Thank you, and we will see you next time.